Well, it's Dr. Ken here with you again. This is electromagnetism, uh, lesson number five, uh, part A. There's a part A and a part B, and we are looking at inductance. So if you're following along in the textbook, then uh, it's chapter 12.4, and we're going to be looking at inductance. So inductance is a property of a circuit component or conductor that opposes a change in the value of an electrical current. And the way it does that, it uses electromagnetism. It increases when the conductor is wound into a coil. Again, that's our magnetic field being concentrated. So what is EMF? And in particular, what is back EMF? So you can see here we have a coil. And if we pass a DC current through, you'll notice we've got a battery here. We turn it on, there's current flowing, and a magnetic field is expanded as the current flows from the positive to the negative. And in this particular case, we've got a resistor, 10 ohms, restricting the current. So that amount of current through the inductor creates an expanding magnetic field. Now, as that magnetic field expands, it actually sets up the field crossing the conductor, which sets up a, a reverse current, or back EMF, that opposes the original current. So that's what back EMF is. is as the current increases, so as this magnetic current tends to increase, as the arrows show out in this direction, then it creates a current that actually wants to oppose the original current that's set up and push it back in the other way. And that's what we mean by, it's what, what we mean by back EMF. So once the magnetic field has built up, of course, there is no longer any back EMF because a back EMF is only created as the magnetic field rises or falls. But once it's established or fixed, then of course there's no more relative motion, therefore no more induced back EMF, and you only have the current that is establishing or maintaining the field. So you can see here on our field here, the field is well established and it's not actually changing, it's staying static. So there's plenty of magnetic field, but there's no relative movement between the field and the conductors. Therefore, there is no back EMF. There's only the current moving in this direction, which is maintaining the field. So what is the inductor itself? An inductor is a component that has a coil of wire and wound around a cord of some kind. It therefore has a thing called inductance. The unit of inductance is the Henry, where one Henry causes an induced voltage of one volt when the circuit is changing at a rate of one amp per second, one ampere per second. So if you have a rate of change of one amp per second, you'll get one volt if you have one Henry in that magnetic field. So we have some symbols for inductors and here you can see um, on the left hand side. So this is what we would call fixed air core. So it's a fixed conductor and it's got air as its core. The next one is a fixed core again but has iron as the core, we use a solid line. And similarly, again, with a fixed ferrite core, and we use a dot line to represent the ferrite. And then finally, a symbol, where this is a inductor, which has an adjustable ferrite core, often a little, little screw of ferrite that you can screw in and out of the inductor to be able to vary its inductance.
So what are the factors that determine inductance? Just like we had factors that affect resistance, then we also have factors that affect inductance. So inductance of a coil is determined by the following things. The number of turns there are on the inductor, how long the coil itself is. It's not actually related to the length of the wire, but the length of the actual coil. The cross-sectional area of the boil itself, again, the cross-section of the coil, not the cross-sectional area of the wire. And the permeability of the core. In other words, how well can that core actually conduct a magnetic field? And that's what we call permeability. So let's look first at the number of turns. And you can see here in this first example, um, I've got two amps through an inductor has 11 turns and has a iron core and it's producing a certain amount of magnetic flux represented by the number of dotted lines so if we have a have a, a quick look we've got one two three four lines of flux we move over here to the right and we put 22 turns on and it's going to go up so you double the turns, you're going to get four times the inductance. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight lines of inductance. So the inductance is proportional to the square of the turns. That is double the turns given four times the inductance. And of course, the length of a coil is inversely proportional. So here we have, again, 22 turns, but the inductor on the left-hand side is much longer for the 22 turns, where the one on the right-hand side is half the length. And of course, half the length, we get double the inductance. So this in, inductance is what we call inversely proportional to length. So as the length gets shorter, the inductance goes up for the same number of turns or the inductance goes down as we take the same number of turns and make the magnetic path longer. Then here we have the, the area of the conductor. And you can see here lots and lots of magnetic flux. So again, we have two amps, 22 turns for our first conductor. So it has less core area, therefore it has less inductance. So you can see here, we've got 100 millimeters square the area. And we've got the same current on the right hand side. So we move over here to the right hand side. We've still got our two amps. We've still got 22 turns, but we've increased the area by four times. So I've gone up to 200 millimeter squared. So in inductance is directly proportional to the cross-sectional area of the coil. So the larger you can make the cross-section, again, the larger the proportional relationship will be with the inductance of the coil. So again, you can just see that represented here graphically with what uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, about seven. And now on this one, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, getting up to 11 or 12. So vastly more magnetic flux because of the cross-sectional area. That being here, this is a cross-sectional area. You can see here that this cross-section is much, much bigger. In actual fact, it's four times bigger because of the relationship of a circle.
Next thing we need to consider is permeability. And on the left hand side, um, we have a coil, kind of given a picture of a yellow form, but it's just a coil wrapped around in air, and air is our core. So it has less permeability, therefore less inductance on the right hand side. We've got much more magnetic field on the uh, on the right hand side so you can see here we've got a lot more magnetic field here in both directions compared to only a very small amount of magnetic field here and that's got to do with the difference between the having air as the core and in this particular case on the right hand side iron as the core so inductance is again directly proportional to the permeability of the core in other words the better the core is capable of conducting a magnetic field therefore it will be proportional to that inductance will go up so we have an equation for inductance this is it here l equals n squared times a times mu divided by l or length where well, l is the capital l is the inductance in henry's n is the number of turns so the relationship is the is the turns squared the cross-sectional area is in meters squared again just directly proportional mu is the permeability of the core so whether it's made of ferrite iron carbon steel soft steel all those different kinds of things that you can have and L is the length or length remember the length was inversely proportional so straight away we can see from the formula that the area and the type of material was proportional I just call that prop for proportional the turns is proportional so it's proportional but it's a special form of proportional it's proportional by the square and then the length the length was if you remember it was inversely inversely proportional So if we say something is inversely proportional, it becomes a dominator on the formula. Something is proportional, it goes on top of the formula and it's up raised it by the square, then we simply take it to the power of 2. So the formula is uh, simply the factors that affect inductance put together. There's nothing magical about it, we're just simply putting the factors that affect inductance together to produce our formula for inductance. So again, um, nothing like a nice little worked example here. So this example, as you can see, we've got a cross-sectional area of uh, 200 millimeters squared. So let's go through what we have. So cross-sectional area, 200 square millimeters. We've got 100 turns on our inductor. We've got an iron core, which has 0 0.006 henrys per meter. And finally, it's 5 centimeters in length. So all we've done is list those over here, 100 turns for N. Our area is 200 times 10 to the minus 6. Remember, we have to turn that into meters squared. And then it's 5 centimeters long, or 0.05 of a meter. Again, converting it back to SI units to meters. And our permeability was 0 0.06, 0 0.06, I should say, Henry's per meter. So we simply put that information into the formula. You can see here. And we have our 100 squared times 200 times 10 to the minus 6 multiplied by 0 0.006 and divided by the length of 0.05 of a metre. So we have an inductance of 0 0.24 henrys. We want to move the decimal 0.3 places to the left. We could also call that 240 
Millie Henry's. Were the core removed and the permeability of the core is that of air, we would just do the same formula again, except we're just going to change the permeability figure. This one here, we're going to just change that to the permeability of air, which is 1.26 times 10 to the minus 6. And without the iron core in it, we would end up with 54, so 50.4 microhenries. It would go down quite considerably. So you can see the relationship there between having an iron core in conductor and having an air core. So the inductance goes down with air, goes up with iron. So self-inductive voltage is another formula we need to know about. So as the magnetic field builds up and we get self-induction happening, we also need to know how we can work that out. And that's simply the inductance of the inductor in Henry's multiplied by di divided by dt. Now don't be too worried about the, the d's. The d's just mean rate of change. So the di is just rate of change in the current. And dt just means rate of change in time. So as long as you know how quickly the inductor is moving, that is its change of rate in time, and how much the current's changing to that rate of change in time, and you know it's inductance, you can actually work out the induced self voltage. And that is V equals L times DI divided by DT. So here's a quick little example. If you had a coil with an inductance of 800 millihenries, it's reduced from 1 sorry, from 4 amps to 1 amp, so there's the rate of change for the current, and in that amount of time, it takes 500 milliseconds. So you're going from no time to 500 milliseconds. So determine the induced voltage. So our formula will simply be V equals L multiplied by DI divided by DT. So again, Here's our 800 millihenries times 10 to the minus 3 millihenries. The rate of change in current will get from 4 down to 1. So there's the subtraction 4 from 1 divided by the time, which is 500 times 10 to the minus 3, because remember it was in milliseconds. So that's where times 10 to the minus 3 comes from. And we were standing still at zero time. So zero seconds. So we end up with our 800 times 10 to the minus 3 multiplied by 3 divided by 500 times 10 to the minus 3. And when you do the math that, we find that we have an induced voltage of 4.8 volts. So three main types of core materials that we use in inductors. The first is air and other non-magnetic materials. So if you use plastic, it's like putting air in the middle. Uh, soft iron is a very common, has great ability to conduct magnetic circuits, so it has really good inductance. And ferrite, which is a ceramic, which has iron embedded in ceramic, and it's very light very strong, quite brittle, but uh, handles very good high frequencies. So see some typical inductors you can see here. And uh, we have what we call I's and E's for obvious uh, reason. They're the parts that make up a silicon steel laminate inside a transformer. Here you can see a ferrite core, quite funny, we wind a ferrite core in a plastic former and then put these slugs through the ferrite uh, slugs through the former and that can make the magnetic path. Here you can see a ferrite core in the middle 
a toroidal ring it's called and it's got wire wrapped around toroidal ring to make the inductor so I've got a big one here and a smaller one there and an even smaller one here this one here is an iron ring which you believe is an iron ring with inductors around it again here you can see up here that's an iron core this small one it's an adjustable iron i oh, sorry an adjustable ferrite core and you can screw that little core in and out and various sizes of inductors there some from very small print circuit board size ones right up to things that look like a transformer but it's a blocking inductor so some of these are low power inductors and most of these what you can see on the screen are used in electronics in particular and again they have a large amount of materials that we can use for the core so here are some high power inductors so on the left hand side the blue one is a three phase filter reactor so quite often you have large installations that have lots of variable speed drive and things they will often put a three phase filter inductor on the main power supply top right hand corner that's a fluorescent lamp ballast used to uh, restrict the current of fluorescent lighting and down here we have a um, inrush inductor for a substation so quite often when big zone transformers get turned on for the first time you can have large amounts of inrush current so they have inductors to slow up the speed at which the current comes into different parts of the zone substation they're called inrush inductors so summing up lenz's law states that the current induced in a conductor will set up a magnetic field that opposes the magnetic field that caused the current and this opposition or this back emf or this holding back of the current we call inductors so this opposition is inductance only happens with magnetic fields inductance is measured in henry's a capital h a core has an inductance of one henry if a voltage of one volt is induced in the coil when the current in the coil is changing by one amp per second remember the current has to be changing for us to actually have inductance the inductance l of a coil is proportional to the square of the number of turns the cross-sectional is proportional to the cross-sectional area and it's proportional to permeability remember those three things were on top of the equation and inversely proportional to the length remember it was on the bottom of the equation and there's the equation again so n squared because the number of turns operate the inductance by the square a for area multiplied by the permeability and all divided by length because length is inversely proportional inductors can have ferromagnetic or an air core inductors used in an alternating current have laminated cores because of eddy currents so if you're in got a magnetic field in an AC situation the polarity is constantly changing and we're going to get eddy currents and things build up in the core and the way we can reduce those is by laminating the core high power inductors used in electrical power substations and low power inductors are mostly used in electronics tuning circuits in particular for telecommunications radio communications those kinds of things so this brings us to the end of electromagnetism uh, lesson five and part a I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about what are the factors that make inductance and how is a voltage induced in an inductor